to the cycle. Yeah. Absolutely. So <clears throat> we have after contact the release of ADP and and the release of the energy in the hinge region, huh? We have a cross bridge formation and release of that energy. The next thing that happens is ATP comes and binds, so doing, releasing that cross bridge, releasing that cross bridge, all right? So the, the cross bridge detachment is coincident with uh, ATP binding, okay? And then and when, when uh, that binding happens, then we have hydrolysis and uh, a reset. But there's... So there's that. If there's not ATP, we're not going to be able to release that cross bridge. What else, however? There's this phase here. There's resequestration of the calcium. I don't have a cartoon showing you the calcium pumps that must be involved in this, but I did mention that those are active pumps that we're going to be there are ATP aces. We're going to be burning ATP to re-sequester that calcium. If that calcium has not been re-sequestered, then troponin is going to remain attached to calcium, and tropomyosin is going to be continuously uh, rolled <coughs> away. So the active site is always going to be open. And the cell is just going to keep contracting until it runs out of ATP completely, right? So when it runs out of ATP, because it has reached equilibrium, which is death, right? Not, not steady state. Steady state is a living cell. Equilibrium is a dead cell. We've reached equilibrium. We can no longer put calcium back where it belongs to reset that contraction cycle. Okay, so it's, it's at the relaxation phase that the lack of ATP uh, is, is acutely felt uh, in the onset of rigor mortis, uh, which comes with, with death. Metabolic equilibrium. All right. So when producing... Tension in a muscle, fiber, a single cell. This is the all or none principle. A muscle fiber is either contracted or it is relaxed. And the absolute tension that a single mu muscle fiber is going to give you, what, what that tension is in, as a force, uh, is a factor of First of all, the number of pivoting cross bridges. The way I like to think of this is how much rubber is on the road. How wide are the tires? In a uh, Formula One, you have these really wide tires. So there's a lot of rubber on the road, a lot of traction to apply a force. What's the overlap between the thick and thin filaments? That overlap, what's the width of that zone of overlap? The... the uh, larger the zone of overlap, the more uh, potential for cross bridge formation you're going to have. But that's not the only thing. The, the resting length at the time of stimulation is related to that. Okay? It's related to that. But there is uh, this law of diminishing returns. So if wide tires help Formula One, why not just make the tires wider and wider? Could we not have tires that are as wide as this table? Or how about as wide as the classroom? There's a law of diminishing returns, okay? Um, and then, of course, the frequency of stimulation is, is going to be related to the tension that is produced in the whole muscle fiber. There we go. Yeah. All right. This is... Maybe one of the most useful slides. 
that I, I show to students all year. And one of the most useful slides. Because many, how many of you in here uh, are or have been an athlete of some sort? Okay, the whole class practically. Right? So what this slide is telling all of you who raised your hands and those who didn't, uh, it's, it's the relationship between the degree of overlap, that degree of overlap, the percentage of the uh, length of the sarcomere that is represented by the zone of overlap, and the potential for tension that that resting length uh, can give rise to. All right? If the muscle, if the zone overlap is <coughs> too great, right? lots of rubber on the road, but there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. There's not much headroom left to contract, right? There's, there's, uh, you need to have the ability to do some contraction. This would be like when we were all standing arm to arm, if we were already palm to shoulder with one another and we tried to contract, we couldn't contract very much. Maybe a few inches across our whole length that would not be able to apply a significant force. All right? So, uh, and then on the other end, this is a muscle that has been essentially torn. So it's been lengthened so much that there is no overlap. Very, very minimal uh, contact between the actin and the myosin. Very little potential for cross bridge formation. And very little potential for tension formation in the muscle. What this is saying is there is this optimal range. There's this optimal range for uh, overlap between the myosin and uh, the actin that's going to give you the optimal power output from that muscle in terms of the tension that that muscle uh, fiber is going to generate. So, but you'll notice this optimal range is a narrow band within what is normal. It tends to be that people like you, young uh, athletes that probably are not especially patient and dedicated to the less exciting aspect of being an athlete, which is uh, the, the stretching, the lengthening of those muscles, you tend to be in here, highly contracted muscles. So. The point I'm making here is that you can get more power output, more power output without adding any muscle mass to your body by adding the right kind of stretching regime, uh, stretching to your to your workout regime, right here, and getting yourself into this optimal into this optimal uh, muscle length. So that, that's actually something useful that you can perhaps apply. To your, to your life now, all right? Do you guys understand what this is showing? It's not that complicated, but it is interesting. <coughs> all right, so there are three phases of a twitch. There's, so any muscle contraction in a single muscle fiber, in a single cell, we're gonna call that a twitch. Not a single contraction cycle, but many contraction cycles that are part of the, the group that was that single neural stimulus. A neural stimulus comes in, we do the excitation, uh, the excitation contraction coupling, then the contraction, and however many iterations of the contraction cycle that we go through before the resting phase. That is called a twitch. A single twitch has three phases. There's the resting phase. It's not doing anything. Then we have stimulus. This is when the neural, the, the action potential uh, impinges upon the motor end plate. All right, and we, so this is stimulus. And there's a little bit of a lag time, this latent period, while depolarization happens uh, across the sarcolemma, travels down to the T-tubules, 
causes a depolarization uh, and a release of the, the calcium uh, through the calcium channels and the sarcoplasmic reticulum, etc. Calcium floods the sarcoplasm. Boom. Okay, here we are now. Just a few milliseconds. It takes only a few milliseconds. And then we go into this contraction phase where cross bridge formation, contraction cycle, release, etc., again and again and again, until the neural stimulus has abated, the acetylcholine has been recycled, membrane potential dynamics reset themselves, and the calcium and consequently the, the calcium channels can close in the sarcoplasmic particulum, and we enter this relaxation phase. So we begin, we reach a maximum tension, and then we shift towards the relaxation phase. Calcium begins to be re-sequestered, and the tension releases. A single twitch. All right, we're going to build on this. We're going to build on a single twitch. Uh, before I get there, though, I want to show that the time course of a single twitch uh, can be uh, variant depending upon the type of muscle cell. There are three major categories of muscle cells, uh, and we'll talk about those uh, later in the lecture. But uh, basically, fast and slow are, are, <coughs> are the two broad categories, glycolytic and oxidative. All right, glycolytic. Uh, being fast twitch, the anaerobic uh, type muscles that you would see in, for example, an eye muscle. Your eye muscle is not meant, it's not muscle that is meant to be doing a repetitive, uh, high intensity, high tension output uh, motion for a long period of time. No, you need your eye to react very quickly to some stimulus that may be coming on it, uh, that, that, that you may be, be reacting to. Whereas uh, the gastronemus and even more the deeper muscles of the body, like the soleus, the soleus is, is the big muscle that makes your calf look as big as it does. People think it's the gastronemus, which is the superficial one, but that's a, a small portion of the bulk. Uh, the bulk of your calf is the soleus. The soleus is a slow response muscle, but it's oxidative in its uh, energy output. And we're going to go through all of that in a moment. All right? Yeah. So when runners, especially if they're like, if sprinters have fast twitches, does that actually happen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I only have so much time in this lecture format to go into stuff. And, and frankly, you could build a whole semester around this, uh, this, this kind of discussion. But yeah, when you look at histologically at uh, muscle at tissue samples from a sprinter versus an endurance runner versus a couch potato, um, you're, you're going to see a difference in, in the muscle fiber, the muscle type distribution. And you can, in fact, change your own profile slightly uh, with, with training yourself. Um, all right, getting back to the single twitch. So here's a twitch in a single muscle fiber. We're going to have, and, and the green is, is the stimulus. And we're going to continue, as soon as we relax, we're going to continue in, have to have another stimulus. But we're going to spread them out to a certain point and allow that tension to reach its maximal level given the frequency of stimulation that we have here, okay? This recurring pattern of stimulus right on the heels of another relaxation phase, this sets up what we call trape. This is going to give us a baseline of continuous tension in a muscle. However, if we push the frequency of this contraction closer together so that we begin a contraction 
before all of the tension has gone out of the muscle fiber from the previous contraction, our baseline uh, is a, it starts shifting upwards. So we get this gradual increase in the overall tension that a, a muscle fiber is able uh, to produce. This is called wave summation. Wave summation. I saw a cloud pass across the brow out there. Is there a question? No? Is, is everybody understand this? Any questions? Okay. Can't read minds, but I try. So, <clears throat> um, all right, so wave summation. Now, I, I, what I'm trying to do is get us to the point of talking about this. Tetanus. So there is uh, this level of incomplete tetanus. We're going through wave summation here, right? Uh, we have a certain frequency of stimulation that's giving us this trape that's uh, in a wave summation until we reach sort of a, a, a maximal level of tension given that frequency of neurologic stimulation, all right? It's, it's, a, it's higher than the one that we see here. It's higher than the one that we see here. However, if we try to contract muscles, and this is what we call incomplete tetanus. It's the maximum tension that muscle fiber can give you given this stimulation pattern. So now, let's try to stimulate that muscle as rapidly as the nerve possibly can. Because we have a certain um, limit in terms of how rapidly uh, a nerve can send an action potential because of the refractory period, the inherent refractory period uh, in, in a neuron, in a motor neuron. So we're going to go as, as quickly as the nerve will let us to contraction. And we are contracting the muscle. We're sending a new stimulus during the contraction phase of a previous stimulus. All right, so we're just continually keeping that motor end plate flooded with acetylcholine. We're keeping the, the gates open uh, with the calcium channels and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And we're going to reach this level of tetanus, this maximum level of contraction. This is a muscle fiber that is just <clears throat> fully contracted, never relaxing, until it runs out of ATP. It's going to run out of ATP eventually. Okay? And then it's going to fall off. All right, so that's complete tetanus. That's a single muscle fiber. Up to this point, we've been talking about a single muscle fiber. How does a, a fascicle work, for example, or a whole muscle work, for example? Well, there are these motor units. We have uh, here in the, in the posterior... Uh, or, I'm sorry, the anterior gray horn, we have these uh, motor neurons, these low, lower motor neurons uh, that are clustered to here, and they're color-coded just for the cartoon. We have a purple, a blue, and a red. This purple motor neuron is going to come on uh, down to a fascicle, and it's going to innervate uh, a series of muscle fibers. That one neuron is going gonna, is gonna to connect to however many... Uh, muscle fibers, muscle cells, all right? And when it fires, when it, an action potential fires, all of those muscle fibers are going to come on. Uh, so we'll say the orange or the red here. This is the red. These muscle fibers, uh, this motor unit, this motor unit comes on and produces tension and then reaches its the maximal contraction and then enters its relaxation phase. However, lying on top of that, superimposed on that, 
is a different motor unit that has a slightly, it's slightly out of phase. So the overall tension in the muscle is able to sum between motor units. So what we're doing here is I'm stepping, walking my way back up that fractal structure of, of muscle fibers, okay? I'm going back up from a muscle fiber to a motor unit up to uh, a fascicle and then to a, to a muscle, all right? There's this coordinated behavior, overlapping behavior between different motor neurons controlling different motor units within a single uh, fascicle. All right. So here is the tension that's produced in the tendon, which is greater than any single motor unit. All right. But it's not the sum total of all the motor units contracting all at the same time, unless you are going maximal exertion uh, at a muscle and trying and really compressing all of this. That is not sustainable. All right, so now the last half, the second half of class, I want to talk about how we're going to pay for all this fun. ATP. How many of you have had uh, a, a, a biochemistry, a basic metabolism before, so I know what I'm dealing with? A couple of you. Many of you have not. This is a 200-level class. I am not going to get into depth with it. I am not going to get into depth with, with a lot of this stuff, and I, I'm sorry for that. Uh, but there's higher level classes, there's graduate classes, there's a whole life for you to get lost in all those pathways. But we will see some of them here, okay? I'm going to give you just what's important. Very simplistic overview of, of what's happening here. So ATP uh, is the currency of, of energy in the body. However, that's like uh, if you're going to the movies... Do you go to the movies and carry a $1,000 bill or even just a $100 bill, or do you go with a 20 You only really need a 20 right? A $100 bill is too much to be carrying around to make change at a hot dog stand, right? Because you're going to clean the guy out at the hot dog stand, right? So we want smaller, easier to burn units of energy. That's ATP. But that, you don't just get a bowl of ATP for breakfast and spoon it in, do you? We eat carbon-based food. Carbohydrates, for example, is, is the primary source of, of energy that we eat, and fats and, and proteins we need for other reasons. What this is, is just combustion. So in, you know, it's the wintertime, you're at the ski lodge, you're at home, wherever, I don't know where you get to see a fire, but uh, we take a carbon source a carbohydrate, it's cellulose. It's got the C uh, sub N H2O <coughs> empirical formula. You know, C H2O sub N uh, empirical formula. A carbon source, some kind of carbohydrate. And we are going to combust that. We're going to oxidize that carbon. We're oxidizing the carbon to carbon dioxide. And what I'm not showing here is the water vapor that's being released as well, steam. So we're taking a carbon source, and a carbohydrate, in fact, and we're oxidizing the carbon to carbon dioxide and releasing the hydrate part of the carbon, the, 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 the water. All right? That's, it's just combustion. That's what's happening here. It is exactly the same in your body. I mean, not exactly, but it is pretty much exactly the same. We are taking a carbon source, you're eating it, we're inhaling oxygen, our cells are oxidizing that carbon, releasing water to the bulk, and then the carbon dioxide, that is the carbon that you were eating, gets exhaled as carbon dioxide. So you, you're, you breathe out all the food that you eat, all right? Except, you know, the food that you absorb, except the, the waste product that passes through your colon. Right. Hopefully that wasn't too much of a revelation for people. That's basic. So, the question is, how are we going to get this carbon source down 
to ATP. And moreover, there are different contexts, different time windows in which we need to burn ATP. There is the short time window, that fast twitch muscle that does not need to go for an extended period of time. We just need a lot of ATP quickly for a short period of time. And then there are times when we need a steady baseline of ATP for a long period of exertion. We're going to see how the body has developed these different systems. The, the glycolytic and the phosphogenic uh, systems for uh, the, the, the glycolytic, phosphogenic, and oxidative. There are these three energy systems. The first I'm going to talk about here is uh, the phosphogen system because this is the shortest time window. This is the shortest time window. Well, what we do is, your, your, your cells, there's this uh, nitrogen-containing compound called creatine. Right here. And some of you who are bodybuilders or athletes may have heard of creatine before. You can get creatine supplements. People shove this stuff in themselves. Uh, there's this protein called creatine phosphokinase. A kinase is an enzyme whose job it is to phosphorylate something. To phosphorylate something means you're going to stick a phosphate group on it. ATP is adenine triphosphate. So adenine is one of the it's one of the nucleotides with three phosphate groups sticking on it. It is these phosphodiester bonds. These phosphodiester bonds, not this one, but if this was ATP connected uh, to the adenine, it's those phosphodiester bonds that are high energy. And, and hydrolyzing a phosphodiester bond is where we're going to release the energy in ATP, cleaving it from ATP down to ADP and pi, the inorganic phosphate. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take some of the phosphate that's on ATP when you're chilling out right here, not exerting. You're going to take some of this phosphate off of ADP and you're going to transfer it onto creatine uh, to creatine phosphate. All right? And give us some ADP as a result. Now that ADP is free to go back uh, towards glycolysis or the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, uh, the electron transport chain, and pick up another phosphate. So uh, let's see here. Oops, get back to that. The nice thing is when you need quick replenishment of ATP, this creatine phosphate in a single step, without having to go through a long metabolic pathway, in a single step, it can transfer this phosphate back to ADP and make it ATP. If ATP levels drop in the cell and there's a lot of ADP, this reaction goes backwards. All right? So we can quickly get phosphate a source of phosphate that's easily converting ADP back to ATP. A very readily available labile source of phosphate. This is the phosphagen system. Creatine does not last. There's not enough, you can't store up enough creatine phosphate in the cell to last for a, a long jog. All right? But this is, you need a, a burst of 10 seconds, a burst of 10 seconds of, of ATP. All right. Um, the next is uh, this myokinase, also called adenylate kinase. Um, myokinase can pick up, it's a, it's a phosphate scavenger. It's a phosphate scavenger. What it does is, it says, oh wow, there's a lot of ADP around. There's a lot of ADP around. Um, what if I just take the phosphate off of one and put it on the other? 
gives me an, AT, an ATP, yeah, an AMP, I'm going to have to deal with that. It needs two phosphates. But at least I get one ATP for an emergency. Right? So myokinase, uh, does, it's a kinase, means it's going to phosphorylate uh, an ADP to an ATP. Myokinase, also part of the phosphagen system. All right, so now we're going to move up. We're going to move up uh, to aerobic metabolism. I should have probably put anaerobic metabolism first because it's a shorter time window. This is going to be the longest time window. We have glucose, and I would love to talk about the glucose transporter and insulin and how this works. Uh, but I, I'm not going to take the time today. I'll do that in the digestive tract, I think. So glucose gets into the muscle cell. Uh, and you're resting. You're resting. So we're going to put this glucose in the bank. We're going to put it in the bank, and we'll see what we'll do with it in a moment. Fatty acids. Meanwhile, you're sitting there. We're going to burn some fatty acids in the mitochondria with carbon dioxide. Uh, I'm sorry, with oxygen. We're going to oxidize the carbon and the fatty acids, kicking out carbon dioxide. This is a source of ATP. We're going to convert ADP to ATP and then use that ATP to transfer glucose into glycogen. What is glycogen? I've talked about it at the beginning of this muscle chapter. Yeah, Logan. Sort of like a polymer of glucose? Yes, absolutely. It is not a stretch to call it animal starch. It's like amylose. Like starch in a plant is very similar in structure to starch, but it's animal starch. It's just a long chain. It's a long chain of glucose, a branched long chain of glucose. All right? We're just going to stash it away in the muscle or the liver cell. In, in this case, it's the muscle. So you're resting. We're, and we, you've got some breakfast in your blood. Insulin is up. Glucose gets uh, transported by the, the GLUT4 transporter. And the fats that are in your blood, you're going to burn a little bit of fat and convert ADP to ATP. Use that energy to store glucose as glycogen. And some of that ADP, ATP is going to uh, get stored as creatine phosphate. So we're, we're like squirrels stacking away for the winter here. All right? We're storing phosphate for the phosphagen system as creatine phosphate, and we're storing glucose as glycogen. Now we're going to see how we use that. So, and, and I, wanted, I have these in green here. So I'm showing that combustion cycle. We've got carbon in, oxygen in, and oxidized carbon out. The water is, again, not shown because it just joins the ambient environment. And I'm not going into molecular level stuff. All right, so now, time to get up. We're going to the gym. We're going to jog around the gym. Time to start drawing upon our glycogen reserves. Glycogen gets converted back to glucose, and we're going to break glucose down to pyruvate. So one of the first days of class, uh, Jacob started talking about fructo, uh, uh, phosphofructokinase. Um, all of that was in reference to one of the enzymes in this pathway. All right? It was one of the enzymes in this pathway. This pathway is called glycolysis, and we'll talk about it more in the digestion chapter, all right, when we talk about nutrition a little bit more. But we're breaking glucose down to pyruvic acid, which is a three-carbon fragment. We're basically taking the six-carbon glucose and breaking it up into two, uh, two three-carbon fragments. And when we do that, we're able to release the energy in that carbon-carbon bond and use it to drive the phosphorylation of ADP up to ATP. All right, we get two ATPs out of that. That's all right. And in fact, 
This part right here, not any of this down here, but this is anaerobic metabolism. Because you'll notice, we didn't use oxygen here at all. We can burn glycogen and glucose to pyruvic acid and get a little bit of ATP out without oxygen. Anaerobic. However, pyruvic acid enters the mitochondria. Mitochondria, is, that, is anyone not familiar with the story of how rickettsia rickettsii was a, um, a, a bacteria that invaded, an ancient bacteria that invaded eukaryotic cells? And mitochondria uh, was an organism that lives symbiotically in all eukaryotic cells. That, that's a pretty cool story. Anyways, uh, and you have mitochondrial DNA that is separate from your DNA in the nucleus and that you inherit it strictly from your mother. So you have your mother's mitochondrial metabolism. This is where aerobic metabolism, aerobic meaning with oxygen, uh, happens. Oxygen comes in to the mitochondria, which then takes the pyruvic acid and throws it into the tricarboxylic acid cycle. It's a cycle that maybe some of you remember from high school biology or something. But uh, the output of the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain is carbon dioxide and boom, a whopping 34 ATP. Very efficient process. Very efficient process. So for one glucose molecule, we get 36 ATP. Two anaerobically and 34 aerobically. Y'all follow me? This is anaerobic because there's no oxygen involved in these two. And then 34 from this process in the mitochondria that involves oxygen. All right. Um, all right, anaerobic metabolism, peak activity, your body cannot get oxygen to your muscles fast enough. Your uh, VO2 max, the, the volume of oxygen that your cardiovascular system can supply your peripheral tissue with is not large enough to meet the demand for oxygen, the metabolic demand uh, that is being called for in your muscles. You are running away. You are running away from... I'm just going to stick to werewolves. I, I am so tempted to get political, but I'm not. Uh, so what do we have? We have glycogen going to glucose, glucose getting broken down to pyruvic acid, giving us 2 ATP. We get 2 ATP for that. We break a carbon-carbon bond and we get 2 ATP. Uh, and then we can also get the creatine phosphate that we had hocked in the pawn shop back out as ATP there. This is a short-term amount of ATP because you're going to go through your glycogen a lot faster this way. You're going to burn through your glycogen a lot faster this way. It's not as efficient. You're going to build up lactic acid, which is going to go through what's called the Cori cycle. It's going to get shipped out to the bloodstream, go to the liver, get recycled. All right. So here are some sources of energy. We have the phosphogenic system, right, which was, this was just normal ATP. There's, there is just a baseline of ATP in the cell, all right? So that ATP can get burned, and that'll last you about 10, second, uh, 10 twitches, which is about two seconds of, of activity. There's about two seconds of muscular activity that a muscle has before it runs out of ambient ATP. The creatine phosphate has about 15 seconds. Gives you about 70 twitches from a muscle fiber. Anaerobic or glycolytic, because it's glycolysis, it's going from glucose to pyruvate. Glyco meaning uh, sugar, lytic or lysis meaning to cut, to cut. Uh, it, 
this anaerobic metabolism, not using oxygen, is about two minutes of, act, of, of activity. And aerobic uh, will give you about 40 minutes. You can get about 40 minutes out of a fully charged cell, a, a cell fully charged with glycogen. If you have a cell that starts out from a baseline with all the glycogen it needs, you'll, you'll clear it out in about 40 minutes. All right? If you go beyond that, then you're going to start burning fats. Okay. So the, the rest of this is just sort of driving these concepts home. Let's, let's, let's take a race here. Let's go for a little jog. Start out. This is, we're going to start out uh, nice and easy, aerobic respiration using oxygen. Uh, from myoglobin, here's another thing I didn't talk about. In certain muscle types, specifically type 2 muscle fibers, slow oxidative muscle fibers, you have a high concentration of myoglobin. Myoglobin is related to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a tetramer that has this porphyrin ring that has an iron in it. It's what makes your blood red. Binds oxygen. These type 2 fibers have myoglobin in it in the actual muscle cell and they'll bind oxygen. Those, the muscle cells themselves have a little stash of oxygen on the side that they can tap if they need to. Uh, here's ADK in the phosphagen system. We went through the, the functioning of that. Ventilate kinase. Uh, here is, uh, this is the other part of the, the phosphagen system, the CPK, for the transfer of uh, a phosphate from creatine phosphate back to ADP to make ATP. So we talked about both of these systems. All right, now we're into anaerobic uh, metabolism here. Uh, anaerobic, they call this fermentation. Because we're, the output here is lactic acid. Some uh, anaerobes, uh, when they go through this process, instead of lactic acid, they, they put out alcohol. Uh, ethanol, for example. That's what, what beer is. Uh, this anaerobic fermentation is going to take glycogen. Here's a, a nice picture of glycogen. Uh, we're going to break it into glucose, which is just this molecule here. The glucose is going to get hydrolyzed into two three-carbon fragments of so pyruvate. Here's one, here's the other. That's going to go into the, uh, that's going to get converted to lactic acid. Even further, we slow ourselves down, nice long aerobic workout. This glycogen is being broken down into glucose. Along with oxygen, the pyruvate that's coming out of uh, anaerobic fermentation, instead of getting converted to lactic acid, there's enough oxygen for it to get translocated into the mitochondria and fully oxidized. We're going to fully oxidize all that carbon, which is in, now in the form of pyruvate, actually acetyl-CoA, but that's a little bit more than you need at the moment, uh, in the mitochondria. You follow? You follow the differing time windows of this process? So there's this thing called oxygen debt. You start out, you're going for a run. Get yourself up to speed. Initially, you're building up an oxygen deficit. An oxygen deficit. Because you're burning through the phosphagen system, you are using. Uh, uh, you're using up all the creatine phosphate. You're taking uh, all the oxygen off the myoglobin. You're building up an oxygen debt. You get yourself to the steady state where you're, you're at some sort of VO2 work. I'm not calling it VO2 max. It may be below VO2 max. The VO2 max being that maximal volume of oxygen your cardiovascular system can, can provide. 
You're at some sort of steady state here. And then you stop. You're done. But as soon as you stop, you don't stop fresh as a daisy, do you? You just run. You're breathing. You're still breathing hard. You're paying back that oxygen debt, the oxygen deficit that you built up in the beginning by tapping the phosphagen system. Your cells don't know, your cells don't know how long you're going to run. For the first 10, 15 seconds, two minutes of the run, they think maybe that's all you're doing. So you go through the phosphagen system. You have to pay that back. So the area under this curve, this is your volume of oxygen that your cardiovascular system is providing. Right? Here's baseline of rest. The area under this curve here is equal to this area. And this line here is, is the actual line uh, of, of the VO2. All right? See how that works? Um, the Cori cycle. I mentioned this uh, briefly. This is just ha the, the process by which lactate is exported from muscles uh, during anaerobic metabolism. And in the, the muscle, it goes to what's called gluconeogenesis. Uh, we, we burn fats that are stored in the, in the liver. Uh, we, we oxidize fats to carbon dioxide and water, uh, producing ATP. We use that ATP to regenerate lactate into glucose that can either be stored as glycogen in the liver or uh, exported back to the muscle as glucose. So um, that, that's all. Oh, yeah, come on in. Got, we're, they're growing. Look, I've got, I've got three of them now. Thank you. Um, I, rather than skip this sl slide, I'll, I, I'd like to talk about, I'll start with this one next time. Um, is that right? Because I want to give you a quiz next time. What am I going to do? Maybe I'll give you a quiz the class after it. I, I do want to talk about this because one of you was asking about this here, the, the different muscle fiber types and histology of the muscles. Yeah, I, I'm just a couple slides short of the end here. So we'll pick up with this next time, and then the following class we'll have a quiz on this, all right? So there's only a couple slides I want to talk about yet. Yeah.